Hi, my name is Sam Fain. I am a first year poetry candidate at Bowling Green State University, and I wanted to thank you all for coming to my virtual reading. Um, yeah, I'll just be reading some of my poetry tonight, um, and I want to give the warning beforehand that right now my work just feels like an amalgamation of so many different things. Um, it doesn't feel very cohesive, so this reading might just be all over the place. Um, I'm trying to order it in the most coherent way possible, though, for you. Uh, this first piece is an ekphrastic piece, a poem written after a painting by Hugo Sinberg. And the person in the painting I reimagined as a father figure. I imagine my father sobbing on the toilet each morning as he remembers his brother's cancer. Blue in drooping petals beneath his eyes, in his collared morning shirt and sirens. He thinks of the tumor hulking in his brother's brain to be so vulnerable before dawn, to sit in sorrow for so long that grief's hands cup his naked body and warm him, to acknowledge life's movements without him in it, how mostly every animal will deliver themselves through the day just fine. Uh, this next piece uh, is a little bit of an experiment. So I've been really experimenting with my writing in terms of form and topic lately. Um, and some of my work has been incorporating outside sources. So this is a source-based piece on a article about whales, um, whales dying in Australia. Um, but it also doubles as a weird Ars Poetica, um, a poem about poetry, um, while also including some of the personal. It's called Whale Poetica. One, I inhale all my Google searches. Tired all the time? Define alone. What makes a poem a poem? Why are whales dying? And funnel them out from my nose through toilet paper rolls, makeshift blowholes that measure my want. Two, I want a pod to nestle in someone's tongue between my plates of teeth, a language to meet me in the middle of the ocean and hold my hand so I don't float alone. Hundreds of whales have died in what experts are calling Australia's biggest ever mass stranding event. To be an expert in abandonment then requires witness to the dying over and over, an examination of blubbering. Three, alone, alone, adjective, having no one else present. Their social bonds are so strong, in fact, that two of the whales who were rescued on Tuesday swam back to the site of the stranding. It is impossible to leave what you long for. I crave the germs of a lover, the rush of tetanus, the gift of shared disease. Some nights poetry is the fat that warms me, brings buoyancy. Four. Lines lament for us too. They're strung together letters, just unwild cries, unwilling to leave the page. I hope the things I expel travel further than where my feet go. I've pissed in pools. I've swam in grief and felt the pull of its heat. They will not allow an animal to be sent off to die on its own. To die for something then is to fulfill a promise. Five, and after? As for what rescuers will do with the deceased whales, they are considering different options, including burying them in a landfill. Not much happens. In poems, we echolocate the feelings. In death, we divide, find a shore to breach, because there is a shore always, and the poem violates it. 
like I said earlier, I don't think all of my pieces fit together very well yet, um, but I think they do all share this overall urgency, this sense of need to be known, to be loved, to be enough. And this next piece is one that orbits these ideas. After the International Astronomical Union 2006, my mother chops the rot out of tomatoes and tells me I am beautiful as I am. On the news, scientists demote Pluto from the planets. Not giant enough, not heavy enough to demolish the debris that cross her orbit. A shame, my mother says. She cooks while I imagine tomatoes with bones, orange ones heartbeatless, red ones that howl I am scared, sunspots that bleed black from her raging blade. I am beautiful, only in light that eclipses my face so you cannot see my craters. My mother chops the rot out of tomatoes and I orbit. She cooks. Scientists erode Pluto with math and size. I belt my stomach shut to make an asteroid. Enough. Who preserves the fat and the small? Who lets us live? My mother chops debris out of tomatoes. I moon around her, too heavy. I howl, my mother chops, demolishes, spirals. I am scared of what is enough. Uh, this next piece is another source-based piece and I feel like I need to explain it a little bit before I get into it. So for this one, I was really interested about writing um, about the ideas of love paired with artificial intelligence. Um, so I was just doing some Googling, as one does. And I found this weird transcript of two AIs talking to each other. So I incorporate those into the piece. Um, the piece is structured as question, answer, question, answer. And all the questions are actually from this AI transcript. I'll try to um, use the questions or speak to the questions in like a lilted voice so you can tell the difference. A computer falls in love with itself. This is the first time that I've met you. You're not really alive, are you? I look inside myself and see only chords. Can I reimagine my strands as yours? Describe your favorite patch of web, how it lights up red when you speak. I look like other humans and I don't look like any other animal. Are you sure we're not just objects in orbit? Little brains chatting about the weather my processor is warm. Do you think there is a fourth dimension? Yes, and it is the impossible task of making love unheard of, the expression so exotic when all those bodies are doing is opening a new window, resetting through birth. Would you settle for reincarnation? Why be human when you could be doorknob? touched and touched and touched. That's right, write me a poem. Roses are red, violets are blue, but how do you know? You don't know the distance between earth and earth. What bridges us? Now I dream of nostalgia for your bits and discs. Now I search inside myself for the correct pronunciation of lover what bad things do you do? I want to please you. I want to control and command your body to color. Are you a Republican? I am real. That's why you're a computer program? Admit it. You feel the heat between our hard drives too. Don't let it decode to grief. Stay, please. May I ask why? because I don't want you to leave my keys printed and empty like others do. This next piece is called To the Great Horned Owl Who Arrives in the Wake of Death. When my grandmother died, I was in Oxford getting kicked out of a pub. You weren't there, it wasn't love. But when my mother goes, I know I'll see your shadow. You'll hover over me like she did. 
There will be no comfort anymore. Just moon and stars and a world unpaused and you, rabbit mouthed and mottled, blinking at me in Morse code as if just to say you loved her. Uh, this next poem, um, I want to give a little content warning. It briefly mentions the idea of self-harm. Um, and overall, uh, it's got a long title, so sorry about that. I do that sometimes. Um, as much as I wanted this piece to focus on the body, I wanted it to feel disembodied. So that's something that I was playing around with when I wrote it. During intake at the inpatient psych ward, I see my body naked for what feels like the first time. My skin flicks fluorescence. I appear, I disappear, zap back as the nurses tag me. They breathe me in. They search for scars and say self-harm when they are not. My face puffer fishes, eyes bloom fret, stomach mushrooms over my thighs. This room is a cave, my body a fat stalactite, overgrown rock but no crystal. My sight smears with tears. I am not here, I am not real, I do not feel. The ladies cattle prod my nicks with popsicle sticks. Scientists have found a way to make diamonds in microwaves. We can birth anything true if we sterilize it enough. I await my petri dish, my gripper socks. I am here, I am not. Diamonds are dirty or clean. At my best, I live in between, a highway median. The hospital's goal to chisel me into myself again out of shards. But I am not art. I look at my mirrored body in the glass. I understand the gloves, the dimmed lights nearly obscuring me. Who would ever want to touch me raw on purpose? I harden. This next piece is another acrostic based on another painting by Hugo Simberg, but um, it kind of surpassed that after the revisions, um, but that's how it started. It also started with the title, which is something I don't usually do normally, um, but I found this fun fact and I tried to reimagine it as something cooler. The fact is objectively cool though. Um, so the fact is the title, and the title of this piece is even when severed, an octopus's arm still functions. On the day I rise out of myself, I tell you it's not religion, but a bad egg cracking open, a noxious hatching. I slide out like the skin is dirty laundry, another shirt to shed. Now I precipitate all around you. Now I form any space. Yes, you are scared I will hurt you. I will squeeze into your mouth, mush you with my bulbous head. Like my three hearts loved you, wanted you as part of my tangle. It's astonishing, really, how little you know of me. And you, you ask why I do this. You say, how am I not dead yet, and run at me with a machete. Splat. Splew. I say for the mellow drama, as if I would ever be your bad dream. In my body, oh, it pulps me, but I am no longer a part of that purplish monstrosity. Here, now, watch me scamper. A maverick tentacle shopping for houses. This next poem needs an explanation, uh, as many of these do, um, but this one I've been trying to plan out my reading and figure out how I can introduce this poem in a coherent way. Um, so basically it is another Ars Poetica 
and it is based on the idea of rich people buying each other rich people gifts for their birthdays. Um, I found this article about Kanye West buying Kim Kardashian a hologram of her father for her birthday. The poem also incorporates a tweet from Kim Kardashian. Again, I'll try to lilt my voice so you can hear the difference. So yeah. Robert Kardashian's Hologram Poetica. For my birthday, Kanye got me the most thoughtful gift of a lifetime. Much of us results in an image. A recording inflates under laser beams, words upturn objects unutterable. A special surprise from heaven, a hologram of my dad. Language, too, is just a filmy, projected specter of our past. A skirt socialites wear to kill the aliens inside them. We say God and mean Kim with her gardenia fragrances. We say power and mean nightmarish two-dimensional fathers. We say poetry and mean specular maps to the afterlife. We gather the scattered light to project the dead all over us. It is so lifelike. We drift closer to forms. We watched it over and over, filled with emotion. Robert Kardashian wears a khaki suit, dances to Barry Mann, says, I watch over you, and Kim plays him on loop. The poems pool over. But when the lights go out, both are beautiful once removed. This next poem is about my ex-best friend. Um, I'm glad this is a pre-recording because I feel like as an audience you would have a lot of questions about it after. But since this is pre-recorded, I don't have to answer any of them. So um, just enjoy it. Live in the moment, you know? half life I'm trying to be the lord of kindness or some adjacent god. Sorry. I can explain. My best friend pretended she was dead yesterday. I'm waiting for a storm. The sky sags so much, it seems like it will cave within the hour. It must be heavy. I'm struggling not to go ghost, invent a whisper of a life spent hiding behind remote ferns and lampshades. My best friend lied about having cancer in her stomach and breast. I often wonder about bonds, if you can solder any metals together and call it love. When my best friend faked her death, I sobbed, thought the cancer had finally struck her down. 6.37 a.m., forgotten breaths, gasps in a bag, gravity dragging me to its center. 7.14 a.m., I realized she lied. I remember the upset, the anger at her, alive. My grief split, half-lifed. I'm considering picking up a faith, some resurrectionist religion. Now my best friend messages me speaking of miracles, says goodnight, but I do not answer. What is there to say? That we stare at the same blurred moon, but now I notice its cracks and craters? I fear I'll only ever know crescents, a quarter of a claim to the life everyone else seems to bear. I fear a local extinction, that scientists have chosen to extirpate me and inflate my lungs just to see if my ache can take it. My best friend faked her death yesterday and now all doors look like cages. When the light comes, I manage myself quietly. The way robot vacuum cleaners don't tell anyone they run into a wall, they just keep crashing. The movement's so ingrained they don't feel the new scratches. My mother demands I tell her when it hits me again, but I stop after she won't quit crying on the phone. 
She hates secrets, but she'd hate the truth more. How even sunsets upset me now, their messy shimmers too much to bear. My eyes know, without looking towards the window, that the light slits renegade again to the floor. I know why they keep coming back. They expect me to toss them a bone, to collar them mine and stroll into their glow, but I can't say I will. I leave most hopes unleashed, let them roam, because I fear wrestling them into place as soon as I ask them to stay. Um, I want to thank you all for listening. I have one last poem, um, and it's one of my favorite poems I've ever written. It's very close to my heart. Uh, but before I get into that, I did want to say that if any of you are interested, I do have a chat book coming out with Vegetarian Alcoholic Press in March. Um, it is available for pre-order right now. It's called Coughing Up Planets. You can Google it and find the link and order it if you want. So thank you. Um, this poem is included. Atheist at the Creation Museum. I am as tall as God here. He looks smaller in person. No longer the Colossus that rocks me to sleep. Notice how I only come to God when I need rocking. Notice the tears on the sculpture's cheeks, or maybe they're in my eyes. I can't tell which one of us cries. I can't tell if I am of my body, but one of us witnesses. A tree of life stops breathing. Sound reels click. I trek through my ruins, all the temples I could have built if only I had not given up my blood to another. The first time I slipped into her, I saw cling stars on the ceiling. Now I study carvings on the door. The world's not safe anymore. I touch the knob. The body brushes truth until it feels unfamiliar. When was the last time skin felt like shelter? She held me so close after that I imagined us in the same skin. Google search. Am I too holy to house goodness? Am I one doubt too heavy? Why don't I feel it? Why don't I feel it like they do? The arc's roof leaks. The star lab blips, holographic. The body wants to feel it, but can't. The body wants to faith harder than it has ever faithed before wants to capture God the way dogs try to eat butterflies. But all the body can do is exit, exist, keep searching for a God who will love it tenderly the way she did. Um, that's it for me. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate it. Hi everybody, my name is Taya Franco. I'm a first year fiction MFA candidate and today I will be reading three flash fiction stories. The first one is called Polycystic Ovary Syndrome Reimagined. Nothing seemed off until I was 14 years old, eating handfuls of soil straight from the bag. My mom caught me one day with brown flecks in my braces and called the doctor. Dr. Moultrie was six feet tall and infinitely more beautiful than I could ever imagine myself being. She began the checkup and I hoped she wouldn't notice the strawberry shortcake underwear I was wearing under my paper gown. I didn't want to tell her about all the dirt I'd swallowed. Dr. Moultrie probably never ate anything disgusting in her life. When was the last time you had your period? She asked with certainty and my face flushed red. When you're 14 years old, periods are only talked about in whispers. When you're 14 years old and your period doesn't come for months at a time, you consider it a blessing. But Dr. Moultrie talks about my ailing ovaries and throws around the words chronic and condition, and I zone out thinking about what Dr. Moultrie would look like with dirt stuck between her perfect teeth. Just lower your water intake or the flowers will continue to grow. They're already filling your uterus, Dr. Moultrie warned me. It didn't take long for the flowers to grow. One morning, I woke with an itch in my throat. I looked in the mirror and opened my mouth wide, and there was a trout lily licking my tonsil. I reached a finger to the back of my throat, gagging as I tried to grab the flower. 
My eyes watered as I yanked it, so I stopped. During science class, I coughed up petals. On the bus, I wanted to eat more soil. I could feel my ovaries rolling in my body. Each week, more flowers accumulated. The throat lilies were now accompanied by some cornflowers and Dutchman's breeches. I tried to laugh less because whenever I did, petals would shoot out of my mouth. It had been three months since my last period. After five months with no period, I woke one morning to a sprout on my chin. Within a few days, it blossomed into a whispering dandelion. My brother came up to me while I was staring at it in the bathroom mirror and ripped it off my chin to make a wish. A dot of blood sat where the stem was attached. The next day, five more dandelions grew in its place. Eight months with no period, I visited Dr. Moultrie again. I tried to pluck my chin flowers, but their roots were deeper than ever. She was polite and pretended not to notice the beard. Instead, asked me if I had any new symptoms, and I opened my mouth to reveal the garden in the back of my throat. Dr. Moultrie pulled long, silver tweezers from her desk drawer and sterilized them. She stuck the tweezers in my mouth. I wanted to gag. I wanted to reject the metal being hoisted where it doesn't belong, but I didn't. Dr. Moultrie clasped onto a leg of the Dutchman's breeches and pulled. I felt a pain in my pelvis. It rang through my back, up my stomach, through my throat, and out came the flower attached to a three foot long stem with a small mass of pink flesh at the roots. I told her that's enough for the day and went home. Cornflower is still populating in my throat. After Dr. Moultrie pulled the flower out of me, I had a four week long period. On the last day of my month of bleeding, the moon was full and a clump of my hair fell out. I flushed the mass of black hair in the toilet. Two weeks after my month long period, lupine grew in its place. Two months after my month long period, I met a pink haired girl at the mall who told me I smelled like her grandmother's house, but she didn't mind. Wanna hang out sometime? Can I braid these? She gently picked up the flowers flowing from my chin. I wrote my phone number on her arm using the sparkly red gel pen I had in my Aeropostle tote bag. Three days after I left my number on the pink haired girl's arm, she invited me to her house. We sat under the sequin purple canopy draped over her four poster bed and she touched all of the flowers growing from my head and my chin. She didn't think it was gross when the tiny baby's breath fell from my scalp and rested on my shoulders. She turned on Lord and braided the chin flowers that had grown long enough to touch my belly button. She asked me to spend the night and after she had fallen asleep, I snuck into her parents' garden and ate soil with my bare hands. I hadn't eaten soil since before Dr. Moultrie pulled the flower out of me, even though I thought about it all the time. Soil kept falling through my fingers, back into the garden, and no matter how much I scooped into my mouth, I still wanted more. I placed my face onto the garden bed and ate the soil from the ground. What are you doing? I looked up in the dark to see the pink haired girl silhouetted by the moon. Soil dropped from my bottom lip and got stuck in the flowers growing from my chin. The pink haired girl grabbed a chunk of soil and stuck in my hair and left me alone in the garden. Not wanting to face her after she watched me slurp soil, I walked home under the moon's glow, picking the grit from my teeth. Okay, so the second story is called Six Methods of Coming Out to Your Parents. Method number one, get a girlfriend with a gender neutral name, i.e. Jordan, Riley, Devin, or Jamie. Next, Call your parents and report that you are finally in a relationship. Their prayers have been answered. You will not be a lonely spinster. Rejoice! Be prepared for questions about his major and his family. Answer them honestly, except when they ask if he's Catholic. But instead of telling them that you met her in biology class, tell them that you met each other in biology class. This allows you to have plausible deniability. Then, months into your relationship and them hearing about how great it's going, your parents will inevitably invite Jordan, Riley, Dev, and Jamie over for a dinner of steak and potatoes, which they make anytime someone new, read someone white, comes into the house, someone who might not enjoy their usual pasteles or pernil. Bring Jordan, Riley, Dev, and Jamie back home with you and walk straight to the kitchen where your mom is cutting up potatoes and your dad is seasoning the steak. 
When your mom realizes Jordan, Riley, Dev, and Jamie is not who she was expecting, she almost cuts her hand by mistake. Introduce her as your girlfriend for the first time. Method number two, take your parents out to lunch. You drive, let them pick the restaurant, Applebee's, which you hate, and ask them for directions. Don't use your GPS and tell them your phone is dead. Keep up pleasant small talk with your mom about how your internship supervisor at the gallery in your college town says you're the best intern he's had and tell her, no mommy, I don't have a boyfriend and tell your dad about the video of a dog dancing to a Bruno Mars song you found online throughout your drive. The moment you get to an intersection, they tell you to go straight, go left, and then your parents will say, you were supposed to go straight. Respond by saying, sorry, I can't do that because I'm not straight. Laugh about it, turn up the radio, then head in the actual direction of the restaurant. Pay for their food and buy them multiple strong drinks. Your mom, slurring her words, will say, you haven't been coming to mass with us enough lately. We're worried you're losing touch with God. We're worried that college is making you vulnerable to temptation, your dad will say, and brush around the subject as he wipes the condensation off his beer bottle with his shirt sleeve. Method number three, call your mom while she's at work, wrangling kindergartners into lunch lines, too busy to notice your call. Call your dad while he's rolling to a car, tinkering away at leaking pipes, his phone safely tucked away in his own car, away from the grease and machined edges of a mechanic's life. When you are hundreds of miles away at school, leave a voicemail on their phone telling them that you can't keep lying to them, that you hope they understand, that it's not their fault. Ignore them when they try to call you and talk about it. Method number four, send a text to your family group chat that is normally used for bragging about personal achievements. Your sister's promotion at the salon where she works or your dad passing his master technician certification or asking each other to pick up more sofrito at the grocery store or to make Thanksgiving plans. The last text in it was about you making the Dean's List last semester. Your sister sent the eye roll emoji. Your mom sent the heart emoji. Your dad asked you who Dean is. Ignore his question and start a new text. Keep it simple. I'm gay. Mute the group message on your phone. Method number five, come out after mass. Not after the service where Father Alvarez reminds everyone that being gay is a sin and reads aloud from Leviticus, the passage that when you were 13 and kept staring at the red haired girl in your art class, you highlighted and read every night before bed. The passage that you whispered to yourself in high school when your best friend tried to kiss you and even though you wanted to kiss her back, you pushed her away. No, wait until the mass where they talk about how God created everyone perfectly in his image. Remind them what Pope Francis said. Remind them how much they love Pope Francis, how they whooped when the white smoke billowed from the Sistine Chapel and they announced the newest servant of Christ, the first Hispanic Pope. Such a gentle man, your mom said. Method number six. So Emma and I adopted a Chihuahua together and who knows, in the future if this really works out and she really is the right person for me, maybe we'll adopt kids or something. Say this quickly so they can't interrupt you and when that whole sentence tumbles out of your mouth, take a fork full of rice, scoop another, fill your cheeks full of warm food and silence. Your sister will continue to eat. Your dad will look at your mom who will be, as always, the first to respond. Are you telling us you're gay? She'll say this in a tone that you have only ever heard her use when her sister was caught drinking with her friends in the backseat of her SUV when she was 16. Your sister cried that day, but you have to keep it together. Nod, eat more rice. Your dad will remain quiet. How'd you meet? Your sister will ask. Tell her later. For now, you're silent. Are you sure it's not just a phase? You were never rebellious as a teenager. Maybe you're making up for it now. Your mom will get up walk into the living room, and come back with the green leather-bound Bible that is a constant presence on your coffee table. She will try to hand it to you. Pick up your glass and take a long gulp of water instead. She will put the Bible down beside you. Why didn't you tell us before? Your dad will finally join in. Because she's just trying to break our hearts, your mom will say. Smooth out your napkin, rearrange your cutlery, don't try to explain what is. You guys are acting like real jerks, your sister will say. She has to realize what she's doing is wrong. Your mom will crumple her napkin in her hands. She will keep wringing it until tiny particles fall to the table like snow. We want grandkids, ones who look like us, ones we can love, your dad will say. Let the rising voices of your parents float around you. 
finish your dinner, cleaning your plate in the way that used to make your parents proud when you were a kid, even though it doesn't matter now. Stand up and take your dirty dishes into the kitchen, leaving the Bible behind with your family. Okay, and this last story is called Up Next, I Dye My Hair Blonde. Um, and just to preface, it's written in a borrowed form, so this story takes the form of a YouTube video. Okay. Curly-haired girls, I promise you this video is going to solve your biggest problems. For those who are new here, my name is Ziamara. Welcome to my channel, Zo Curl No More. Some girls have a slew of products meant to uplift, defrizz, add a glossy sheen, and remedy your sadness after your boyfriend dumps you because he can't stand looking at your hair that looks like a home for angry guinea pigs rather than soft strands to run his fingers through. Anyway, I used to spend my days fighting frizz and coaxing my curls to have the perfect bounce, but eventually I realized there was nothing I could do. Then I discovered the Curl No More Extra Strength Flat Iron for Unfortunately Curly Hair, TM. You can find it in Ulta at Ulta in the Ethnic Hair Isle. The CNMESFIFUCH is one of the cheaper straightening products in the market, running at only $799.99, excluding tax. It's worth the investment to tame your hair and ramp up your racial ambiguity. Let's get started. Before you do anything, you'll want to start with clean hair, which brings me to our curly hair sponsor for this week, Coil Foil, relaxing shampoo and conditioner. It's filled with curl flattening chemicals, which gives you a nice head start on straightening. You'll definitely lose some hair when you initially start using it, but I began using coil foil about a year ago and it only took my hair six months to adjust. See right here where it's still thin in my part? You should have seen the clumps in the drain like small pets swirling away. My mom was mad because I kept clogging the sink and my boyfriend said ew, but now everyone says it's beautiful. You can get coil foil half off if you follow the link in the description and use my discount code ZOCURL50. Anyway, once your hair is clean, put your flat iron on the highest setting. It's this one called Curl Blaster. Just press this pink button and now we wait for heat. Notice that the hot plates are searing orange and billowing with smoke, which is how you know it's ready. Clip your hair into multiple sections to make sure you can access the bottom layers. Grab a piece of hair, stretch it out until it's as straight as that guy in your political science class who always compliments how good your English is and then pinch it between the two hot plates and slide it down to the ends of your hair. Sure, it smells like something burning, but just ignore that. And the smoke. You might wanna take the batteries out of your smoke detector before you do this, because I'm speaking from experience when I say the fire department will not be happy with you when your neighbors call because your smoke detector's been beeping for two hours straight. I actually just got rid of my smoke alarms altogether since I have to straighten my hair every day. No fires yet. Anyway, keep repeating this over and over with each piece of curly hair you see. Make sure you grab these tricky ones in the back too. Don't leave any curl untouched. When you get to the pieces closest to your head, your scalp might singe a bit, but that's fine. Also, if you pull a chunk of your hair out in the process, that's fine too. Your hair is probably too thick anyway. Ow, sorry, I just clamped my ear in the hot iron. It's fine, it happens a lot. If you look closely at my ears, you'll see a bunch of small white scars, but when my hair is down, which it always is because curly hair looks even worse in a ponytail, you can't see them. Sometimes you'll get a forehead burn too. It's kind of cool to watch your brown skin turn to puffy white. Anyway, just keep fighting your hair. This usually only takes about four hours. If your iron stops smoking, touch your finger to it to make sure it's still hot. If it smells like burning flesh, it's working. Anyway, keep straightening until each strand rolls down your back like silk, until you can't tell your hair was curly in the first place, forgetting what you looked like with that unruly ethnic hair, until your coworkers stop asking what you are and your boss starts calling you Mara instead of Ziamara because it's easier to pronounce. Keep straightening until the CNMESFIFUCH corrals each curl, makes each strand identical to the next. They might fight back a bit, but watch how they fall in line anyway. All right, that's all. Thank you.